Welcome to Atheist Talk. My name is George Kane, and I'm your host for the evening. My guest today is Nancy Bradshaw, who has worked with for over 15 years with victims of domestic abuse. She's seen how religion can make it difficult for women to leave an abusive relationship and how it causes women to struggle with becoming independent. Tonight's discussion will be about the role of religion in domestic abuse. Uh, we will be covering uh, some of the religious beliefs that promote or support domestic abuse. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you very much. So tell us, uh, who are domestic abusers? The predominantly domestic abusers are men. And quite often we tend to think of them as low income, low education. Um, but the truth is, domestic abuse covers all gamuts. Um, they can be rich, they can be poor, they can have any career. In fact, one woman I worked with, her husband actually worked as a domestic abuse counselor at a domestic abuse center with the abusers and then came home and abused her. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, that's just an example of they're anybody. And for a while I did some assessments with these guys and they tend to be very nice guys. So after you do an assessment, you'd be like, that's a nice guy. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times the women will be told that too. Oh, you're so lucky you married him. And so I think a big thing for people to remember is they look like everybody else. They, they, they don't have big symbols on them that say, I'm an abuser. Yeah. But almost always men. Mostly men about, um, and again, some of the statistics I've heard, but about 90 or over 90% of the abuse is ma males perpetrated to females. Okay. I wonder if some of the uh, data might have a bias in it that uh, if men are ashamed to report that they're victims of abuse. And that is one of the things when they talk about with the men is that sometimes men won't um, mm -hmm. report because that is a shameful piece for a man to kind of to admit that, whoa, I'm being abused. Um, then we also have the other piece that sometimes abusers say they're victims. Mm -hmm. um, one case I saw, he had gone to the local resource center for women, this one man, and said he was a victim, but then tried to lock his wife in the house and burn it down. So mm. he was not the victim. So I think it's probably hard to get real solid statistics on that piece, but much more so men than women. Okay. So, and it'll be interesting to see if that changes as women overall get more power in society. That's oh, right. something I'm kind of curious to see what will happen. Yeah. So uh, what is dom domestic abuse? What are the behaviors that are characteristic of it? All right, but, and the first piece is it's a pattern of behavior and that's really key. It's not just a one-time incident um, and the, the goal of the abuser is to control. So you're gonna have all kinds of behaviors that that batterer wants to control her, control who she sees, what she does, um, all those kinds of things, and then that's his behavior. And so some of the different types of abuse um, would be one like financial, and that would be keeping her from the workforce. And I see that a lot where they have children and he says you should stay home with the kids. Now in a healthy relationship, that can be awesome, but in an abusive relationship, that's his way to keep her from having any money. Mm. And a lot of times they really will restrict her money. And, and access to money. Um, I know one woman had to you know, sit there and decide whether peas or beans were cheaper because she couldn't make it work. <clears throat> and her husband just kept saying, I trust you can do this. Hmm. And she couldn't. Oh. And then the, the biggest one, I should start with that, but the biggest one is physical abuse. That's the one most people think about. And part of that is it's visual. If I come in into your home and I have a black eye and a broken arm, it's obvious something happened. The other thing with physical is it will get the police to come out. I can get an order for protection and I can get charges against my batterer. But if he does some of the other types of abuse, that's not much I can do. I can't call the police and say he didn't give me enough money to buy groceries. There's nothing they're gonna do, so mm -hmm. it doesn't get documented. It's sort of hidden. Oh, um, some of the other types of abuse, uh, sexual abuse, and that can be rape, which is very, very common in um, domestic abuse and abusive relationships. Um, 
going out and being with prostitutes that's outside of the marriage rules, coming home with STDs. One woman I worked with was common. He would get her dressed up, they would go out, she would pick up a guy. This was all pre-planned. Then they'd go back to a hotel, she'd have sex with him while her husband watched. Hmm. And this was not something she wanted to participate in, right. but she was felt forced. And she even talked about what it was like, the, the look on her husband's eyes when he was watching, and it was just this very creepy thing. Um, also, some people will withhold sex, not in the, not tonight, I've got a headache kind of way, mm -hmm. but the, you are so disgusting no. that I couldn't possibly mm -hmm. touch you. And that really, those words stick with women. Um, another one is the verbal and emotional abuse. And I think that's probably one of the most powerful. And that's guys saying things like, you disgust me. Nobody would ever want to be with you. You're lucky I put up with you. Uh, one woman I work with now, her husband's favorite words, her name for her was spineless parasite. Mm. And so she heard this over and mm. over and over. And so then she believes that she's a spineless parasite. Um, even though she had a full-time job for years, did really, really well at her job, was exceedingly independent before she got married. Over the years, he had just slowly worked her into this where she would believe it. Oh, um, There's also a thing called gaslighting, and that's where um, I would tell you something that's not true. And in one example, a woman was in her house. Her husband said, I'm going to go to the store, walks out the front door. He goes around the house, in the basement, up the basement steps, and in the kitchen, and she turns to him and said, I thought you were going to the store. And he looks at her and says, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? Well, then she's stuck not knowing what's reality. And when they do this over and over and over, you get women who start to really question. Oh. And, and that's actually a torture technique. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those that they can just keep doing. And then pretty soon she's not sure. Like, are the lights dimmed or are they OK? And she won't know. That's, that's bizarre. <coughs> it, it is. You know, that is. So. Certainly, uh, everyone would agree that the physical abuse is domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, are these other types of abuse you've talked about, such as uh, verbal uh, abuse, uh, domestic abuse in themselves, or do they are they part of uh, a domestic uh, abuse pattern that uh, the, of which the main component is physical is beating? Um, actually, the, the physical is usually a really small part. Oh. Um, if I'm a batterer and I can control you without going to the physical level, I'm probably going to do that. Um, so if it works at this level, <laughs> get, you know, I might just go there. A lot of the women I've worked with have either never been physically abused or it's been a couple of times that there was a physical assault. And women predominantly tell me that the physical is easier, um, which is counter to what we would think. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, the big fear is if somebody hits me, that's going to hurt. But over and over, what I've heard from the women is the bruises healed. The words stuck mm -hmm. forever. And in my work with women, it can be years later, and they're still struggling with the words um, that they hurt. But the physical stuff is gone. Um, the fear of stuff is still there. Yeah. But. A couple of days ago, I went to my doctor, had a routine doctor's appointment, and the uh, medical assistant who was mm -hmm. interviewing me beforehand uh, asked, uh, is there domestic abuse in your home? And I told her, no, I live alone, and I treat myself very respectfully. That is <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> well, and that's one of those I think it is hard. I'm glad that they're asking. Um, it's really hard to ask the right question because a lot of people who are in an abusive relationship might not even realize it. And so if you ask them, they'll say no. Right. And yet, if I work with somebody for a while, I'll start to hear things. And, and those are the ones that's not physical because that's clear. But I'll start to hear that the demands, the house had better be clean or else. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm sure, uh, listen to you, that 
uh, it being continuous has to be a part of the uh, of the abusive pattern because certainly in uh, most relationships, there are times when they would argue, insult each other, that sort of thing. Right, and those are going to be, overall, you look at if the power is fairly equal, then then you're right. Then you might get a blip of, I'm mad and said something I shouldn't have. Um, but with that, what you're going to see is, I'm apologetic and I work to make change. With the battering, it, it's over and over and over. Um, sometimes people talk about the cycle where you have the explosion, the abuse, the honeymoon period where it's, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that, I'll do anything to change. And then the tension builds up until you have the explosion again. And so you run that over and over. And then over time, the honeymoon period just disappears. And it's just that. Sometimes the victims will also act out violently. Um, one situation, I had a woman, she had been like curled on the couch for two and a half hours while her batter was screaming at her. And then she picked up a glass of water and threw it at him and it hit him in the face. He got a bruise. So that she charged her with the domestic. Mm. But while her behavior, that incident was a violent act, when you look at the overall pattern, he was the abuser. And often I'll talk to the women about who has power in the relationship. That's that big piece that we look. How effectively do police investigate uh, these things? Uh, is, is it a consistent problem that they're It, it is. Misdiagnosing? Um, a couple of things that happen when the police <laughs> came out. <laughs> so let's me. say we have a domestic. Um, what often happens is she's a wreck. She's screaming and hysterical and he is calm. Calm as a cucumber. He switched it just like that. So when the police come out, the first thing they, they look at and say, hey, he's calm and makes sense, she's a wreck. So they tend not to believe her. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they'll separate them for a while, but that doesn't help. If they do take one to jail, um, one of the other problems that then happens is, so let's say he goes to jail for the night. He calls her and tells her, you had better get me out of here. So now she's in a place where she has to go to the courts and possibly say it didn't happen. Or if she gets an order for protection, he tells her you better get that dropped. So she'll go to the courts. And then the, the police and the court systems get very frustrated with these women because from the outside, the thought would be, well, here's her chance to go. And I'm like, no, it's not. This is complicated. This is a step in the process. So the police can be very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I've had women tell me things that police have said that were blaming them. You've told us that um, it's impossible to uh, pigeonhole the abusers, that they're every economic uh, uh, strata, every education mm -hmm. level. What about the victims? Really hard to that too. And we tend to, to blame the women. There's mm -hmm. a lot of blaming comments, like how did she get in that relationship? At one point, they did a mega study where they looked to answer that question. What is it about these women? And the only thing they found was that they were women. Um, they're just women who get into what look like very good relationships. And when I ask a woman to tell me the beginning of her relationship, mm -hmm. I often hear of an incredibly wonderful story. So they get into a good relationship. One of the differences we find is if a woman has little childhood trauma and lots of family support, she's more likely to get out earlier. And then the other extreme, if she's had lots of childhood trauma and no support, she's probably going to be in that relationship a lot longer. So there's a piece where we can kind of look at that. Um, I had a professor years ago who told me his sister had a full scholarship to France to do um, write and illustrate children's books. And three weeks before she left, she met her batterer and he convinced her not to go. Hmm. They're that good. So the control was starting right from the outset. Yeah. So a question that I'm sure occurs to a lot of people is why don't the women leave? <laughs> Which is one of my least favorite questions, but it is a good question. Um, the reason it's my least favorite question is nobody asks why doesn't he batter or why does he batter mm -hmm. and I'm always like we need to put the blame back on him but why women don't leave is very complicated um, 
the children is often the biggest reason that they stay and the biggest reason that they leave. Um, some women can protect their kids more within the relationship. A lot of batterers aren't interested in the kids. They don't spend time with them. They don't go to doctor appointments. But if she leaves and starts a divorce proceeding, all of a sudden he will step in and now he has unsupervised time with the kids. And often he will use the kids to get to her. So for her, she may decide to stay. She can protect her kids. Also, we don't have a good system to help women. They can stay at a shelter for six weeks, but that's not long enough to get anything set. So when they leave, they literally are walking away from everything. Their home, their beds, their food, and those are the questions they ask. How am I gonna feed my kids? Where am I gonna stay? So that's a terrifying piece. And then the, the other piece with that is from the time she leaves to the next two years, she is the most risk for suicide, or not suicide, homicide, rape, stalking, and physical assault. And so that is her most dangerous time. If you look at the reports of women mur who are murdered, very often you will find that they have already gotten an order for protection. Hmm. Uh, Chillum, uh, I'm sure our, our audience, though, wants us to uh, yes. get the question of uh, what have you found in your, in your studies uh, that religion does that uh, promotes or encourages or validates domestic abuse? Kind of, I'll give it overall piece. Overall, because religion is about control, um, and religion often tells men that they are on top, that they have more power over women, that batterers go for that, and then that helps them continue because they can be like God said, mm -hmm. I'm the head of the household. And also for her, that fear of disappointing God is really can be st stick with her and keep her in that relationship. Yeah. Uh, and religions tend to be uh, very uh, uh, patriarchal, paternalistic in their defining of uh, marital relationships. Yep, just about everywhere. I, the, the stuff I looked at, and, and I actually got this from this book um, called Religion and Men's Violence Against Women, which was edited by Andy Johnson. He's a professor at Bethel. And as I read through this, that was a predominant thing that I saw that with the religions, men were in power, women were below. Um, and then that kept women there. This d book does sometimes sort of, they try to look really good. <laughs> Some of the religions, I found that a little frustrating. So, um, that, and even the, the biblical text, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things in the Bible that are anti-women. Um, you know, women don't talk in church, be silent. And again, the piece that the, um, the batters use that, you know, it says right here in Timothy, you have to shut up. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, in religions, they define the male-female role as uh, dominance uh, for the male, uh, the role of the woman as uh, uh, submissiveness that uh, uh, if they don't, uh, follow it, don't obey, they're sinning, they're uh, violating the religion and uh, uh, giving an offense to God. Right. And then in some religions, then that gives him the right to punish her, hmm. to discipline her. She's not being submissive enough. Therefore, I can hit you to make you more submissive because that's what you should be doing. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us uh, specifically about any of the religions? Um, the Catholic Church is one where if you look at all the higher-ups are men, the women are kept down. And it wasn't that long ago that women weren't allowed on the altar. So women were kept from doing things. Um, another piece with the Catholic Church is if a woman divorced, she may not be able to participate in the sacraments. So now mm. she's, she's held back from being a part of the major community, which again is very painful for people to say, you're not part of this group. Uh, and then recently they're doing a, a watchman program where they're again promoting men being head of the household. Mm -hmm. And that is just batters love that because the church said, I need to make sure you go to church on Sunday. And if you don't, there's gonna be a price. Mm. And, uh 
conservative Protestants too, I know, have uh, uh, the very first uh, Minnesota atheist activity, I think, that I got involved in was a demonstration outside the Metrodome uh, when there was a Promise Keepers meeting. Oh, yes! Oops, yes. <laughs> and, and that too, they look good from the outside. Right. But again, there's that, that, that little piece in there of men are in charge. And like I say, these batterers will take, take it. But if you confront somebody, they'll be like, oh no, we're all for family values. I'm like, eh, no, it, it, it needs to be the couple then. Right. Oh, but yeah, they were big for a while. Yeah. Good. And uh, uh, anything else with the uh, conservative Christians, fundamentalist um, Protestants? One of the things that I found is the Quiverful movement, okay. and that's the group who, they don't belong to a specific Protestant church, but they're Protestant, and they have no birth control. So mm. the women are basically baby makers, and they, um, they are to cook, clean, homeschool, and do all that, and be available for sex whenever her husband wants which I thought was pretty awful after a whole day of taking care of kids, that she does not have the right to say no. I'm sure very popular with the husbands. But absolutely, yeah. absolutely. He gets to go to work, come home, and this is what I want, better be done. Um, they, and they're very strict about the kids and how they behave. And if mm. they don't behave, it's mom's fault. Oh, so I think that's just kind of that huge piece that really shows he's on the top, she's on the bottom, um, the girls wear the long skirts um, and all that, and it's very, very strict rules. Um, so, and in the Protestant, a lot of the Protestants think that women were made to be Adam's helper, and mm -hmm. then we went and got him to sin, and so we're kind of stuck in those places forever. Right, that would... Uh uh, the biblical uh, issue that uh, uh, man wasn't created for woman, but woman was created for man. Yep. Uh, Eve yep. was created to be uh, Adam's companion. Right, and so that's that piece that we're always there. Um, and then a lot of the, the churches really hold that the marriage needs to stay together, mm -hmm. no matter what. Um, currently, I, I'm working with a woman who her church has said that she no longer has standing to leave, even though he hasn't done anything to get better. And so she's forced into either leaving her husband and losing all her support or going back. And mm -hmm. if she leaves her husband, then she doesn't think she's a good Christian. It's a tough spot. Yeah, uh, we could uh, talk for quite a while about the other religions too, but uh, I'm curious about where uh, the atheist community fits in. I think we do really well. I mean, as far as I looked at the Atheist Ten Commandments and the Humanist group and actually the Satanic Temple's um, Seven Tenets, and there is nothing in our dogma or rules that would promote battering. And in fact, it's mm -hmm. the opposite. Because um, in there, there are pieces of everybody's body is their own. Mm -hmm. And if you make a mistake, you need to go rectify it. And so if I was a batterer, I wouldn't like that. Because right. I want to go somewhere where I can get, quickly get forgiven and move on. So there's that piece and the piece of if I'm working with a woman and it's, she's a secular person, she doesn't have all that baggage with her. I'm not fighting that part of the piece. I can, all, I can just work on her learning what the abuse is and taking a stand without having to you know, hear the church pieces right. that, because I can't argue that with a woman, I'm gonna work within her system, but somehow to see that, you know, sometimes I even say, I don't think a loving God would want you in this relationship. And that's as far as I'll go. Mm -hmm. But I know she's got a whole lot more stuff to work through. Right, and atheism and secular humanism have no, uh, definition of the male-female relationship as having uh, a God that's placing uh, judgments uh, upon them, requiring adherence to uh, uh, the uh, uh, social norms of an ancient society. Right, and I think there's a whole lot more men and women are equal. Um, the, the people I know in this community, 
there isn't that I'm a man and I'm better than women. It's what I, I often hear is we want women in our leadership communities. Yes. We, we, we want things to be equal. And that sends a huge message to the women. If I'm equal to the men, then I'm going to be equal at home too. Right. Uh, with the Minnesota Atheist Board, I'm not sure if it's, uh, it, it's a, an odd number of people, mm -hmm. just like the Supreme Court is supposed to be. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the balance is today, but uh, just recently it was predominantly, uh, predominantly female, which is, uh, uh, is unusual for the atheist community, but it's something that they're always striving for, is to get female participation. And I think that's that key piece too. It's, it's talked about and even I've heard with um, conferences and stuff that people try to make sure that there's more women speakers. Right. And so here's a group that's saying we want to show women in leadership where as within the churches the women are always kept down. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some churches they can be pastors but not a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, we've got two minutes left. Okay. Uh, what would you like to uh, say as closing thoughts? Um, I think a couple of things is if, if a woman comes to somebody and says she's being abused, mm -hmm. the biggest thing is believe her. Hmm. And I've asked the women I work with when I've given a talk before, what do you want me to say to them? And that's what I hear overall, believe us. And so if somebody does believe them, get them help. Connect them with somebody who gets domestic abuse. That's the key piece. And just, you know, with our community, we're open and keep having those kinds of conversations. The more we talk about it, the more we understand it. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, just w one quick mm -hmm. question. Uh, so, uh, you say get them in touch with someone who can help. Who, are, who is it who can help? Um, mental health therapists. Okay. Um, but I really encourage people to call the therapist ahead of time and find out do you know about domestic abuse right. and what is their experience. Okay. Um, sometimes I've had to undo what other therapists did. Oh. Not okay. Um, and then connecting up with one of the, uh, the refuge is one, um, one of the shelters. Shelters. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot tonight. I hope that uh, the audience has too. And if you're, uh, you'd like to find out more about our organization, about Minnesota Atheists, uh, go to our website, uh, mnatheists.org, and uh, you can contact us there. If you give us your uh, postal address, we'll send you one free issue of our newsletter. And if you send us your email address, we'll put you on distribution for our weekly calendar of events. So if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. <laughs>